Hello, everyone. I'm Jay Krishna, and I'm here to present our work, Arbiter Bridging the Static and Dynamic Divide in Vulnerability Discovery on Binary Programs. This is a joint work between Arizona State University, Uricom, University of Southern California, and Cisco. Automated vulnerability detection is an integral part of the secure software development lifecycle. And to, there are the auto, types of automated vulnerability detection techniques can be split into two major categories, specifically static and dynamic analysis. Each type of analysis provides its own benefits as well as drawbacks. Of these two, dynamic analysis such as fuzzing have risen to prominence in recent years due to the sheer number of vulnerabilities that they've been able to identify. So we took a closer look into why fuzzes are so good. Fuzzers aim to trigger vulnerabilities, such as memory corruption bugs, that can be triggered by, that can be identified by different types of sanitizers. The key idea that fuzzers leverage is that sanitizer alerts are a property of memory corruption bugs. And fuzzers have, fuzzing has achieved great success in finding vulnerabilities by taking advantage of this property. From these insights, we identified a relation between vulnerabilities and vulnerability detection techniques. Our intuition behind this project is that the properties of a vulnerability convey requirements on its analysis techniques. Therefore, in order to identify a certain type of vulnerability, such as memory corruption, you need an analysis technique that can identify the properties related to memory corruption. And this leads us to understand that vulnerability detection is a vulnerability-driven process. Now, going back to the two types of analysis that we have, static and dynamic, Static analysis provides high scalability and high coverage, but unfortunately lacks from a high number of false positives. Dynamic analysis, on the other hand, does not scale as well or gain as much coverage as static analysis, but it has significantly fewer false positives in comparison. We'd like to combine these two analyses to get the best of both worlds and complement each other's faults. And to do that, we identify three properties that are common to a lot of commonly found vulnerabilities. And these properties enable us to combine analysis together to gain scalability and precision. These properties are P1, which is data flow sensitive vulnerabilities, where the vulnerability depends upon some data that is being processed. P2 is easily identifiable sources or sinks. In any applications, you in any application you have a lot of data flows, therefore to be scalable, your analysis has to focus on the data flow of interest that can be specified by identifiable endpoints such as a source and a sink. P3 is control flow determined aliasing. In static analysis, pointer aliasing is a common problem that often leads to incorrect results, but we found that in most cases, the pointer aliasing problem can be solved purely by control flow analysis. These properties allow us to combine static and dynamic analysis together to get the best of both worlds. The easily identifiable sources and sinks property allows us to use static analysis and thus gain high coverage and scalability to identify candidate paths. The data flow sensitive vulnerability property allows us to use dynamic analysis and gain high precision. We use under constraint symbolic execution for this purpose. The con control flow determined aliasing property allows us to adaptively augment context sensitivity in under constrained symbolic execution, thereby providing a configurable trade-off between precision and soundness. We combined these techniques together and created the Arbiter Analysis Platform. From the user, it expects a vulnerability description that specifies the three properties related to the vulnerability, as well as the target binary application. It then performs multiple analysis in combination to detect the vulnerabilities that satisfy the vulnerability description in the target application. We identified several CWEs that satisfy the properties that we have identified, and we call these vulnerabilities property compliant vulnerabilities. And we chose four different CWEs as targets for our, for our evaluation. These are CWE131, incorrect calculation of buffer size, which usually happens when the size of a dynamically allocated buffer is incorrect, perhaps due to an integer overflow or underflow. CWE134, use of externally controlled format string, which occurs when the format specifier used in a printf-like function can be controlled. CWE252 is unchecked return value, 
which is something that is often overlooked when using security critical APIs like SetUID. CWE337 is predictable seed in pseudo random number generator, which is a surprisingly common mistake that developers make when generating random numbers by using the current time or a constant value to seed the pseudo random number generator. And just to clarify, these are there are other CWEs that can be identified and detected by Arbiter, but these are the four that we chose to evaluate. And for the evaluation, we generated vulnerability descriptions for each of these CWE types, and we ran each of those on 76,000 x86-64 user space binaries available in the Ubuntu APT repositories. The overall evaluation took a couple of days on a Kubernetes cluster, but ended up generating 1130 alarms. We manually analyzed each of those and classified them into 661 true positives and 410 false positives. We could not, in some cases, we could not classify them because the code base was just too large and we have around 60 of those that we just could not triage. Some of the vulnerability descriptions that we came up with are not always indicative of errors. Therefore, in some cases, we had more false positives, but on average, we have close to 60% true positives. So one of the most commonly used tools for finding vulnerabilities is fuzzing. However, we cannot find all bugs using the existing fuzzes that we have. To identify whether fuzzing can detect the bugs that Arbiter found, we try to use a commonly used fuzzer, AFL, to find some of the bugs that Arbiter did. For that, we chose 25 bugs, and we generated triggers for those, and we tried to see whether AFL could fuzz those and find these bugs. Out of these 25 binaries, only seven were standalone binaries, and of those seven, AFL could only fuzz five because two of those required inputs from either the network or graphical user interface, which AFL does not support out of the box. After 24 hours of fuzzing, AFL only found three bugs, and it's also important to note that the three bugs that AFL did find was in the presence of manually generated harnesses, where we told AFL exactly what arguments or n minor variables to fuzz. Without these harnesses, AFL was not able to find any of these bugs. In our evaluation, we've used applications that have source code available. So a question could be raised as to why we performed our analysis on binary code when the source code was available. Well, when we were going through the reports of Arbiter's CW131, which is incorrect calculation of buffer size, we kept finding these identical patterns of buggy heap management code, and these patterns were found in 25 different packages. So when we went through the source code of these packages, we found that there, we could not find the same pattern in the source code. In fact, there was no C code in the source packages. It was all written in OCaml. And once we got to the bottom of this, we found out that the bug was introduced at compile time by the OCaml compiler and affected all 32-bit OCaml programs. We reported this vulnerability and it is not triggerable right now. Since we had evaluated Arbiter against a real world data set, we, had, we could not estimate the false negative rate of Arbiter. In order to do that, we evaluated against a synthetic data set. And for that purpose, we used the Julia data set, which is a synthetic data set that is created to test static analysis applications. And we can see here that Arbiter's true positive rate on Juliet is very similar to that of the real world evaluation. And you might also notice a tiny slice to the right of the false positive bar that is labeled as new positives. So when we were going through the results of Arbiter's evaluation on the Juliet dataset, we found a lot of cases where Arbiter was uh, reporting some bugs as positives, but the Juliet manifest reports that they are not positives. And eventually we found out that these are actually bugs that the Juliet dataset contains. We found 190 test cases that follow this pattern where the Juliet manifest states that it is not triggerable, but we found that it was actually vulnerable. So if you have a 32-bit integer called data, and if it contains a large enough value like two raised to 32 minus one, the absolute value of this particular value will be a very small value, which is one, which is less than the square root of two raised to 32 minus one. And following that, 
the multiplication operation basically squares this large value and the result will be a 64-bit value, but when you store it into a 32-bit integer, which is result, it becomes a really small value, which in this case will be one. Now, if you replace the print unsigned line function with something that allocates a buffer, like malloc, it will be allocating a buffer of one byte and might end up copying two raised to 32 bytes into that buffer, which leads to a heap overflow. To summarize, we've identified a core property for vulnerability detection techniques, which is that it depends upon the type of vulnerability. Using this insight, we identified three properties that enable a hybrid analysis, which improves scalability and precision. We evaluated our implementation on 76,000 x86-64 user space binaries available in the Ubuntu APT repositories and have close to 60% true positive rate and found bugs that no other tool could find. Arbiter is available on GitHub and as Docker containers. And I will take any questions now. Thank you.